I'm Dean Tolson, um, and as chair of the Computer Science and Engineering Department here at UCSD, it is my great pleasure to welcome you back to UCSD and to welcome you into our building and to our department. Um, I know many of you here were here before there was a CSE department, um, but I hope that you consider us your home. Um, I know we as a department absolutely consider your legacy uh, part of our legacy. The UCSD Pascal Project is, is part of our history, and as history typically does, uh, it has its fingerprints all over our present. Uh, it brought us, you know, um, as a department in a, in a university, but it brought us uh, early recognition that helped us recruit faculty and students. Uh, we're still a young department, um, but we have shot up in terms of international research reputation uh, into the very top ranks. Um, and, and frankly, I believe UCSD Pascal is one of the reasons why this has always been a highly technical campus. And you'll see com computing uh, infused all uh, in, in disciplines all over campus. Um, but it's really been in recent years that we've seen this just really accelerate dramatically. And it's really uh, impacted who we are. Uh, demand for our classes has gone uh, through the roof. Um, but that, that demand has actually come from two sources, the second one a bit less expected. Um, the demand for our major, not surprisingly, because this is happening everywhere, has, has, has grown like crazy. Uh, but in addition to that, um, students have figured out you know, across campus that even if they're a sociology major or political science major or history major, that if they know how to program, then they're, they're going to be able to have much more of an impact uh, on their field. And so those students are, are, are in our classes, not just at the, at the undergraduate level, but even at the graduate level. We have a, a, a fairly high percentage of even graduate students that are non-majors that are taking our classes. Um, and, and so this also means that, in addition to doing a lot of teaching, um, but it also means that there is a lot more interdisciplinary research uh, going on than ever before. Um, again, that's happening all over campus in small ways, but, but also real deep collaborations with uh, disciplines such as cognitive science and ECE, the, the Data Science Institute, where we have uh, shared faculty uh, in, in all those places. And it's especially true in the medical field. Uh, in addition to having a world-class bio bioinformatics group here, uh, we also have several faculty with joint appointments in the School of Medicine using your, your computing and computation, in many cases machine learning, to find novel solutions to, to society's uh, critical health issues. So we have a lot of students, that's no secret, um, and we've been uh, trying to hire like crazy, so you know, I'm, I'm not going to go too far in, time, in, in terms of trying to catch you up with everything that's going on in the department. But certainly, one of the big things is is, is student growth and trying to catch up with with that in terms of faculty growth. Um, you know, but it, but but hiring faculty is slow and it takes time, and it's because every time we hire a faculty member, we are going after the the very best people in the world, which means we're also competing with uh, uh, the the top institutions in the world. But we are UCSD, and we're already a world-class department, and so we do have some advantages. And, and so we've hired something like 25 faculty in five years, which is a kind of a, a pretty unprecedented uh, level of growth. Um, and it's, it, you know, it's, we're, it's an exciting place to be right now because we are a, a department that is very junior faculty heavy, and junior faculty you know, do great things, and they're aggressive, and they have great ideas, and they, they uh, you know, you know, build, you know, build their research groups quickly. Um, and, and so there's a lot of things that are, that are going on. Another area where I feel like uh, we are continuing Ken Bowles' legacy is in education. So much of what he did and what you did was, was really just about creating a better educational environment for students. You know, the, the, this radical idea that programming, especially programming for students, should be this interactive uh, experience rather than, um, you, you know, write a program and, and submit it to the mainframe and come back tomorrow. Um, and, and so, um, and, and today what you'll see is that we actually have one of the most celebrated computer science, uh, 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 computer science education research groups uh, in, in the world. And we are taking you know, the best principles that, that they're discovering and coming up with and applying them uh, directly into our, to our own classroom. So, um, so we're very pleased to be hosting all of you. We're, 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 we're ex excited about the UCSD Pascal history. We're, we're excited about this legacy. And we're excited to have you on campus. Um, I hope you enjoy your time here. I hope you stay engaged with the department because, again, from our perspective, you are part of us. Um, you know, but, but you know, so do things like subscribe to our newsletter and please, you know, and, and, and come back uh, and visit as often as, as you can and, and try and stay engaged with what we're doing. Um, all right. So, I believe the next thing on the agenda is the video.
Kenneth Bowles was present at the creation of computer science on the UCSD campus. In 1965, he helped Henry Booker create the Applied Electrophysics Department, CSE's great-grandfather. And Bowles used so much computer analysis on his projects in radio astronomy that he was appointed to lead the university's first computer center. And in 1974, he was introduced to the LSI-11 produced by Digital Equipment and packaged by Terek. It was just a keyboard, a monitor, and a little disk enclosure with a CPU in it, which is what we would recognize today as a PC. But it was brand new packaging at that time, very revolutionary. Ken jumped on it and said, uh, well, the Pascal that's running on the Burrow 6700 in somewhat experimental mode uh, can be transferred to the LSI 11 and once it was and you buy a bunch of these PCs put them in front of students now you've got a computer lab. By the time Demchak joined the team in 1977 Bowles and a fast-growing group of undergraduates along with grad student Mark Overgaard had already built the pseudocode operating system and UCSD Pascal, an evolution of the Pascal programming language to run on the LSI 11. And it grew from initially uh, five people before my roommates got into this, uh, and maybe into 10 by the time I joined, and by the time it was all over, maybe 43. Between late 1974 and 1980, the UCSD Pascal project changed the course of computer science education and made UCSD itself one of the early brands in computing. But with the growing dominance of MS-DOS, UCSD Pascal began to lose ground. The undergraduates, however, scattered to other institutions, bringing UCSD Pascal's DNA with them. One undergrad ended up at a startup called Apple. Bill Atkinson, uh, who I think was one of the single digit numbered employees at Apple, he took that and put it on uh, the Apple II and sold it as Apple Pascal. Okay, uh, so next on the agenda is, um, uh, I, I, I think you're all aware of the, um, uh, the Ken Bowles uh, uh, scholarship uh, fund that was set up and uh, you, you, we, the, the university has already had the, uh, the privilege of being able to fund several students uh, with this fund. Um, Kenneth Waugh, are you here? No. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, we're, we, we, we have one student who, um, who has received the scholarship that wanted to say something, but um, uh, uh, unfortunately she's going to say it through me because she couldn't be here. Uh, this is a statement from uh, Michelle Young. Uh, who um, uh, wanted to address you, um, and uh, she, she received her BS degree in 2019. Uh, she says, during my time at UCSD, I majored in electrical and computer engineering. Currently, I'm working as a software engineer at Microsoft in Seattle. As I interact with other new graduate students and hear about their college stories, I cherish more and more how amazing and helpful the computer science and, the computer science and electrical engineering communities are at UCSD. I believe that we truly have some of the best students and leaders in our community, from student-run technical events to sharing helpful links in the Facebook page, tutorials, job openings, et cetera, peer tutoring in the CS basement, EC Tutoring Center, we students stood together. In addition, in addition to my fellow peers lift me, lifting me up, the Ken Bowles Scholarship opened many incredible doors for me. Perhaps the most Im impactful result was that the scholarship empowered me to attend the Grace Hopper Conference at that conference, I was able to attend their career fair and network some of, with some amazing women in computer science. Attending that conference helped kickstart my postgraduate career, and I would not have been able to attend without the Ken Bowles Scholarship. All right, so. So uh, uh, thank you again for, for all of you that have contributed to that scholarship. I think it's having an impact um, and will we'll continue to have an impact. Um, but also keep the uh, keep that legacy alive, which is which is important to all of us. So I want to thank our panelists uh, for joining us. Um, and so uh, I think most of you know who this, uh, who uh, many of these people are. Uh, but uh, we're starting with uh, 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 Mark Overgaard, who uh, actually. <laughs> Sorry, you chose that seat first. That's your fault. <laughs> Uh, Mark Over Overgaard, who received his uh, MS from here in 79. Um, 
Uh, next is um, uh, Stephen Franklin, who is actually a retired faculty member for UC Irvine, who's gonna give us a little different perspective. Uh, next is Joan Mac McNamara, who rece received her BA in 80. Uh, and then uh, next to me is Richard Kaufman, who received his BA in 78. Um, and so that's all the introduction I'm gonna give, give you because we're gonna start with having you introduce yourself, yourselves. And so if we can, um, uh, if we can sort of briefly uh, have everybody, uh, first tell us what your role was in the project, uh, and second, uh, just tell us, tell us uh, briefly uh, what you've done since then in your careers. And so I am gonna start at that end with Mark. <laughs> okay, so um, my role in the project was sort of second in command uh, to Ken um, uh, as a general thing. And then uh, the, in addition to a variety of kibitzing on, on various fronts, um, the, one of the particular things I worked on was the, the P-code uh, architecture. Uh, we had taken uh, P-code from, uh, from the uh, Swiss uh, folks. Um, but it, they didn't worry about space compactness at all, uh, and so I did some studies on, on how to encode it more efficiently, uh, which was crucial uh, to get into the small systems that we had, so. And then since then, well, uh, that's right. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so uh, I was part of the group that, as, as you may remember, um, uh, the project had to be moved off campus because uh, it was uh, endangering the tax, uh, uh, the tax-free status of the University of California. <laughs> that didn't seem like a good thing to endanger. And in fact, I just learned something in the last few days, which was interesting on that front. Uh, Julie Irwin Rucker, uh, you may remember her. Uh, she's not here today, uh, but she sends her greetings. And she lives in Del Mar, as she and, and Jeff have done for uh, forever. Uh, she lives next to a guy uh, who used to work for CDC. Uh, she lived with uh, next to him for all, all for forever as well. Uh, and a week or so ago, she was taking him to the airport. She drove; they drove past UCSD, and she talked about how this reunion thing was going to be happening, and and uh, there was uh, honoring Ken and all this other stuff. He says, "I know Ken Bowles," and it turns out that uh, this guy, Bob Holmeyer, and a colleague were in Ken's office talking about a possible connection with CDC for the Pascal Project. When Ken was called out of the room, uh, he came back in to, to take a phone call. He came back in and said uh, that call was from the legal folks uh, uh, at, uh, at the campus. <laughs> and the decision has been made uh, that the uh, project has to move off campus. So I thought that was so. So Julie and this guy have been living next to each other for decades and somehow it, it never appeared that, uh, that they both knew Ken Bowles or that this guy was, was in the room uh, basically when, uh, when Ken got that news. So that was interesting. Okay, so I'm part of the group that, that moved over to Softec Microsystems. Uh, Ken decided to stay at the campus uh, and he ended up uh, focusing on Ada uh, here. Uh, and um, so I was at Microsystems then for several years. Then I went to Telesoft, uh, then uh, moved up to the Bay Area to work for an RTOS, a real-time operating system company up there. And after that, uh, I founded a little company, Pigeon Point Systems, uh, and basically for the following uh, 20 years, um, continued doing that stuff. Um, Rich Vass was a co-conspirator uh, on that. Um, and uh, even though we were um, bought and then spun out, bought again, uh, we still did the same stuff pretty much uh, through that period. Uh, so uh, uh, and that, that's when I retired, 2017, and, and now I uh, do photography. Um, so uh, that's me. Stephen. I'm Steve Franklin. I was a faculty member at uh, UC Irvine, uh, taking Alfred Bork's software and perverting it for computer-based testing. Alfred and Ken knew each other from the days back in Alaska. Mm -hmm. And Alfred mentioned to Ken that there was computer-based testing. Ken and I met. I think the big takeaway I want to add here is Ken's real devotion to undergraduate education, not just in terms of the select team that became the UCSD Pascal team, but he was motivated by he wanted to create a programming environment in which these students could 
learn and learn in a self-directed way. And that was, uh, he and I really hit it off on that. I, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, Ken's influence, I recently retired from UC Irvine where I did a mixture of teaching in uh, computer science and building the university's IT infrastructure, including as I was telling somebody uh, in fall of 1993, taking my son workstation and making it www.uci.edu, where it lasted for six months before the university caught on to the fact there may be something to this. <laughs> but uh, just to give you another example of the profound influence that working with all of you had on me, uh, and working with Ken most especially, uh, it tuned me into the value of virtual machines. And Marx being extraordinarily modest in, un, in not fully stating the impact of taking and making the Pascal microcode that could shrink a very complicated thing down to where it was really much more democratic uh, in any event. So I was tuned into the idea of virtual machines. And so, uh, I guess it must have been, oh God, sometime toward the beginning of 1995, maybe it was 1990, yeah, it was beginning of 1995. I was about to head off to the World Wide Web Conference uh, in Darmstadt, Germany, because a colleague and I had uh, found a way of uh, using the web in that case for instruction. Uh, in any event, I'm grading a paper late at night, grading finals late at night for operating systems, and the night shift operator comes in and says, have you heard about Java? <laughs> Long story short, Bertrand and I show up in Darmstadt. We ask everybody, what the hell is Java? The Sun people don't know, but there are other people who are attending. And so we get a group of people together to talk about it. I won't go into the details of that, but here's the real punchline on it. I came back from that thoroughly convinced that because of the virtual machine, and I had seen over so many years the power of that, starting from UCSD Pascal, I managed to convince some folks up at UC Irvine who are currently working on developing a, yes folks, a way of using computers in education. Uh, artificial intelligence, all of that kind of stuff and so forth. Instead of doing it with download a program, why don't you just do it in Java? Long story short, that became the Alex, A-L-E-K-S project, which was spun out a few years later after the university learned it was possible to monetize scientific discoveries at the <laughs> university. <laughs> to McGraw-Hill, the, the, I'll just leave it there, but what I will say is that the teamwork that I saw in Jean-Claude Falmanier's students working together to build this software, it reminded me so much of what I had seen with all of you years and years earlier. So from undergraduate to graduate to commercial, on to you. <laughs> Not that you're commercial, but I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have no easy closing cleanly. Junior next, let me remind you of the question, which is, what was your? <laughs> it was the impact that Ken Balls had had and what have I learned? Yeah, it's so, the people so, you work with that so matters. The, the, the question was, what was your role in the project and, uh, and, and what have you done in your career since then? Okay, let's see. I came to the, uh, well, I'm Joan McNamara. And I came to UCSD in 1976 as a junior. I had done my first two years at uh, Mesa Junior College. Came to UCSD and I was gonna be a counselor. I wanted to ultimately be a counselor. And I joined uh, Fourth College, it was called at the time, before it became Warren. And um, I was told I needed to take UCSD Pascal. It was a requirement. What is that? I don't even know what a computer is, right? <laughs> so, so I go and I say, okay, I'm going to get this over with my first, you know, quarter. So I go take the class and just 
fell in love with programming. It was so bizarre, you know, I went from psychology immediately over to, okay, I'm gonna have a computer science major. But part of, the, a big part of that reason was uh, Ken Bowles. Because he was so supportive. At the time, I was, I don't know, how old was I? Maybe I was already 25. So I was a little older. I had a son who was six years old who grew up running around in the lab <laughs> at, uh, on campus here. But Ken was so supportive of having me part of the project. And, and in general, he was so supportive of women and diversity. I mean, he just wanted everyone who, you know, he felt was capable, you know, of doing a good job being part of the project. And he really, uh, you know, gave me some great support during the four years. I graduated in 1980. But I worked most, I, main machine I remember working on was at General Automation, one of those, uh, their equipment and, and porting, you know, helping to port the UCSD Pascal over to that equipment. But, uh, but my memories are all the support, you know, that Ken gave me over those four years, you know, because it was a challenge raising a child, you know, running around the lab, and he was, you know, he was really good to me. But, um, and after that, I did go to Softec Microsystems, and then I went over to Telesoft, but instead of continuing as a programmer, I went into marketing and sales which I regret a little bit at this point. I kind of wish I'd stayed on the technical side, but uh, I attended bar through much of my career going to college, and so I liked being around people, so that was something I thought I would stay with. But uh, after I left Telesoft, I decided that I wanted to change a career. I used to have a philosophy that you shouldn't do anything more than 10 years. It's time for something new. So I went to law school. And then I uh, ended up being a prosecutor for the city of San Diego and prosecuted very early on. Uh, I was doing consumer fraud, some internet fraud cases and with eBay, and we were doing some interesting stuff back there in the 2000s, you know, and trying to stop people from, from doing, you know, consumer fraud on the internet. And so I think my whole background, you know, here at UCSD and the knowledge I had about computers in general really helped me a whole lot in that area, so. And now I'm retired, traveling, visiting grandkids, and taking classes and having a good old time, <laughs> but. Uh... Richard. Uh, my name is Richard Kaufman. On the project, I was sort of the text file guy. Mm -hmm. And so that meant writing the front end of the compiler and also the text editor. And um, Ken was, um, who I only started calling Ken much, <laughs> much later, um, KB, was um, uh, really uh, influential in my life. So I was a punk sophomore. Mm -hmm. And he just kind of took us all on mm -hmm. right off the bat. Matter of fact, I think because of the Pascal project, it was a lot more fun being an undergrad mm -hmm. than being a grad student. We had and had more impact. Mm -hmm. So we were doing things back then that I think the current CSE environment here is like it now. Team-based stuff like the multiplayer gaming courses and things. We were doing it back in the 70s, just hacking on Terax and the like. So that was really, really neat. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, from UCSD, uh, I did the uh, Tektronics for a little bit, doing a UCSD Pascal-based logic analyzer that was a hoot, and then came back when everybody left to do soft tech, and then again to do Telesoft. And then I went off to Sweden for a couple of years, uh, working for the company that eventually bought Telesoft, and then uh, started a 20-year history with uh, DEC Compact HP, uh, working as uh, the basically the CTO for high performance computing and then cloud computing. So I kind of did the shift into that math stuff I hated. I started to do for real. Um, going back in history, if remember, anybody remembers the name IIS Institute for Information Systems. So that was Ken Bowles, Don Norman who was like one of the big essential folks in user interfaces. And then probably not a lot of you guys remember Dave Rummelhart. Mm -hmm. So um, I wish I had paid more attention to him back then because uh, I'm doing AI now. And he was the one who figured out backpropagation for multi-level network for encoding neural nets and uh, is insanely influential in what is now AI. And so anyway, I did uh, the HPC and, tech and uh, cloud computing for a while. Uh, did some time in Korea working for Samsung. Uh, and now I'm at NVIDIA. Uh, 
I sort of, I'm the boss of 15,000 GPUs that do AI. <laughs> so uh, my most contentious relationship these days is with the CFO of NVIDIA. I, my picture's on her dartboard for how much I cost her. <laughs> um, and I'm also working on orchestration software, Kubernetes, if anybody's heard of that. Uh, and then if you go to ngc.nvidia.com, that's us, where we have lots of containers and uh, model registries. And now it's kind of like trying to, uh, I'm now kind of a pointy haired boss type, and it's trying to keep up with everybody because um, everybody's like smarter in a snow stovepipe than I'll ever be. And that's why I wish I paid more attention to Rummelhart because it's all his stuff. Great, thanks everybody. Um, so next question, some of you addressed this a little bit, but those who wanna, wanna add something, uh, what, what were some lessons you learned from the UCSD Pascal project or from uh, uh, working with Ken that, 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 that have influenced your career? It's about working with people, mm -hmm. and it's the team, and uh, <laughs> the person to your left and to your right is extremely important, and Ken was very, very good at uh, leveraging that. And I, I say this as a person who was not necessarily in that milieu, but the respect that people had for each other and that he cultivated, and he didn't pit people, as best I know, against each other because people seemed to get along reasonably well. Yeah, the, uh, anybody remember the order of the purple bathtub plug? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so these days, the way you would put it is if, uh, who screwed up the build, right? Back then it was, who messed up the, the, the potential release of UCSD Pascal or really pulled one? And he used to award that person the purple bathtub plug. And you had it until the next person messed up. Um, but the cultural aspect of it that was important was that, yeah, it, 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 mistakes happen. Don't, he never got down on individuals for it, ever. I never heard him do that, ever, 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 ever. It was like, okay, let's learn what happened, let's figure out what the root cause, people now realize I'm using words for what, how, how the kids do it today, but figure out what the root causes are, document it, make sure you, do, you know, you, the, the next mistake you make is gonna be more interesting. And so um, he really built that into us way, 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 way back when. You know, nowadays it's normal, but back then it certainly wasn't. And I, I think the, uh, as others have commented, um, the extent to which undergraduates, so I was a grad student, but, but the bulk of the team was undergraduates, uh, and uh, the extent to which uh, undergraduates were involved in everything, in, in, in the deepest way, in the, uh, making the whole thing work, uh, I think was likely unique uh, on the campus at the time. Uh, I don't know that for sure. Um, and it's only my wish that um, projects today uh, here in this building uh, are the same way. So I don't know whether that's the case or not, but, um, but it is a very good way to operate. I mean, I guess I could add as part of the group, the problem solving was like, uh, we just really learned how to work at a t as a team to solve you know, problems. And so that to me trans can translate into all aspects of your life and certainly helped me a lot, you know, in not only in law school, I mean, I just felt like I had a real advantage in law school based upon my experiences, you know, here at UCSD and what I did in the computer field and, and to brag a little, did great in law school. <laughs> but, um, and then, you know, on to, you know, being a, a prosecutor and then being able to, you know, fully understand what's going on out there on the internet at the time, and you know, and and take. And it was interesting. We'd get these classes by the FTC, you know, on internet fraud. You know, very basic stuff and everything. And it was like, a, and not, most of the time, people couldn't understand what they were talking about. But fortunately, I was able to, you know, thanks to Ken and UCSD, understand, you know, how the whole thing worked. But uh, but I, for me, it was the team spirit and, and the whole, the ability to, to solve problems that I came away with as being, you know, really helpful. And I would add one other thing uh, that, uh, that I, that hugely affected my life, I think, and that is that watching Ken make things happen, uh, make connections with UCI, with 
every person in the world it appeared. Um, uh, it's, it was just uh, fabulous. Uh, and uh, uh, working through how to propose so and so to this, this project to, to general, general automation or to, um, to Terak or to whomever. Um, he was just a master at, at facilitating and, and bringing things together and making things happen. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of my success in doing the same, I think, is, is credit to, to my ability to watch him uh, do that. He wouldn't have kicked us out of his office if he was having a phone call with anybody. He used to just, <laughs> used to just hang out. It was like a clubhouse. And he'd have a call going with somebody. And he'd tell you what was going on before, during, and after. Mm -hmm. Actually, this takes me to my next question, which is, uh, does anybody have any anecdotes they wanted to share, something that illustrates you know, who, who Ken was, or what the culture in the, in, in the group was? So it actually, I'll, it, my comment there uh, follows the made up thing I just said. Uh, so Sunday afternoons, uh, I was usually on campus. Um, there weren't very many people on campus, typically, on Sunday afternoons. Um, uh, he was typically at home. And as often as not, we were on the phone together. Um, he, he would have some new prospectus uh, to a company, to a, uh, another campus. Um, he, he prospecti was what Ken did. Uh, and, and so we would chat about this prospectus, this pr proposal uh, to some outfit, uh, and uh, how, how it would be received, um, uh, what their concerns were, uh, what the project's abilities were, um, all that kind of stuff. And so it was a, it was a live uh, um, time uh, for seeing this 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 dynamo of energy uh, in operation, uh, and I really valued uh, that time. I don't. I didn't see that side of Ken that much because I was, you know, the little your uh, <laughs> undergrad. But what? And my my story is more personal, I think. And what? If I may share, that's okay. You know, and so. I mentioned that I had a son, a young son, and I was tending bar when I f to, to make a living on weekend nights as I, when I first started at UCSD. And, and the bar got taken over after a year or two, and, and I was really concerned about being able to stay at, at UCSD and afford things. And, and, and I was talking to Ken about having to maybe leave the project to go off and, and do something you know, else or try to get some other kind of job. But, but he talked me into staying. He helped me and supported me through that. He also found a way for me to get some extra funding of some sort you know, so I could stay on campus and make it all work. And so for, so for me, he was just you know, instrumental in, in, in me you know, graduating from UCSD and then going on to what I did. So I'm just was always grateful to him right. for being a a dad of sorts. <laughs> yeah, but he was great. I have two really quick printer stories. <laughs> <laughs> the first, the first one was early days of the project. We got this Printronics printer, which was this really fancy thing. <laughs> And we had this LSI 11, but hooking up the two, well, there was a nine month wait from digital to get the Unibus card that would act as a printer drive, pr printer controller. Mm -hmm. And um, I almost heard him swear. He, he was really mad about this. He came in one Saturday with the wire wrap gun in his back pocket and a motherboard. <laughs> and he just said, the hell with this. And he built a printer board, uh, you know, an LP11 Unibus <laughs> controller bar, put it in, and the damn thing worked. And it was like, <laughs> then long after he'd left Telesoft, and um, he had just bought a printer, and he was on the phone with me saying, what the hell is with this 150 megabyte printer driver? You know, we built a whole operating system that could run in 48 kilobytes. What the heck is this thing doing? And at the time, I worked at Hewlett Packard, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, I'm going to ask one last question for me, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. But what, what would you identify as the, you know, the legacy of the UCSD Pascal project? And a lot of the legacy is, is here in this room, and we've talked a lot of the, I think, about the personal legacy. But, but, but I'd actually like to focus a little bit on the technical legacy. What do you think are really the, 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 the things that have lasted and impacted? I started the last few times, so you, you guys can. <laughs> I've been talking a lot. Why don't we pick somebody from somebody in the audience? 
I have an informal hypothesis right now that I've been sharing with a couple of people around here that Ken's biggest technical legacy may not be pseudocode, which turned into Java and JVM, which is what everyone recognizes, but there seems to be a plausible case that Ken was the father of the command line, which if you think of every Windows or Macintosh screen in the world that has a little line of words across the top that says like file, edit, and then all the other things, well, that came from UCSD Pascal, and from there it went to Apple, and from Apple it got onto the Macintosh with a little mouse assist, but it doesn't seem to trace back to Xerox, and the story is, is that Apple got the Mac interface from Xerox. But the question is, is, uh, is as far as we can tell, Apple got the command line from UCSD Pascal, and from talking with folks here, it seems to have come from Ken. There may be a few other variants of it that Richard knows about, but right now there is a plausible research topic to be pursued, which is, was Ken Bowles a father of the command line? That's a pretty big legacy. Well, I seem to remember, and unless I'm remembering, <laughs> remembering incorrectly, that UCSD had the first, Pascal had the first text editor, or one of the first ones on a screen-oriented, you know, text editor. And so that, to me, and when I often talk to people about being on the project, I, I say that, you know, that it seemed like that came from Ken, you know, <laughs> our ability to do that on the screen. Not of Richard's fingertips, but... Yeah, finger, uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> guidance so, of so, Ken, I guess. Yeah. But. So, so, so my question for Richard is, uh, do you think that's true? I, I'd be surprised if that's true. So. Uh -huh. There were editors from the C cell system at MIT and um, that were full screen, mm -hmm. but the general interactivity and the command line, um, that was a mixture of stuff that we cooked up in the Pascal project. And let's put it this way, we didn't have much source material to work with when we were doing it, but folks were doing full screen editors. But the real trick for UCSD Pascal wasn't that any one component was unique. You know, the command lines, it was the, the Purdue system, was that Lego? The, the um, Seymour Papert thing, is that what you're Well, about? the Seymour Papert thing was MIT. That had a, had a bit of a command line. The Purdue system, um, I forget its name, had, had a bit of a command line, but it didn't look anything at all like UCSD Pascal's. The, but the big trick was, if you were a mere mortal, the system that you used involved a key punch. And it involved, you know, sacrificing goats to get machine time on a big mainframe someplace. And so it was getting all of the best of what was possible at the time, arguably extending it a bit, and getting it to work on a small computer that you could get interactivity with. So instead, if you were trying to learn how to program, instead of being a, you know, if you were lucky a one hour or worse, an overnight submission, um, it was, you could try it right then and, and, and see if it worked. Um, Roger will remember this, but we were really lucky because we had ZZ accounts um, at the computer center here, which basically gave us unlimited time. And we were chewing up, I was probably chewing up 5,000 bucks a month in, in, in compute time just by myself, and I was a piker compared to Roger. <laughs> um, and, and it was disgusting with the punch cards and the uh, mm -hmm. um, But the second we got self-hosting, that's a key thing. We were, I think, the first of the self-hosted systems ever. We could develop the system on the system. The interactivity and the productivity improvement was insane. And everything from, I think we started that, and I think everything else has just been keeping that alive. I'll take this discussion of the historicity of various <laughs> things offline as to when things happened. I think I can add some stuff. What I would like to do is hijack some of this film thing here to point out Ken's contribution to education. It's not about the UCSD Pascal project, but since this is being recorded, you were the benefit of it and a number of other people were. Ken innovative arrangement of the order in which things were presented and his incorporating of Papert's uh, turtle graphics mm -hmm. and his recognition of the importance that if you're going to teach, if you're going to learn programming, it helps to have a problem domain that makes sense to you. Figuring out what the 
roots of a quadratic equation is does not necessarily help you that much to understand the basic flow of logic. And to this day, I think that the order in which he arranged things, starting with the basics, moving to encapsulation very early on, he had a successor to that in uh, the Carol, Carol the robot, uh, Rich Pattis's at uh, Stanford that uh, long after the UCSD Pascal project passed, uh, that became very influential in undergraduate education. So it's not about the legacy of the Pascal project, it's about the legacy of Ken Bowles, I got it right this time, <laughs> uh, in terms of understanding what would help people achieve, understanding things from their perspective. You're a beginner, how can I arrange these things so it makes sense to you? Back to the legacy of the project. <laughs> I, I, I think it's a legacy of Ken and, and yes, well. a very important legacy of the project. The educational, you know, we've talked, we've, our initial answers were in terms of the technological legacy of the project uh, and the educational legacy of the project is just as important. Probably, I don't know what Anne would say in terms of which was more important for him, but, but the educational side of it was very, very important to him. So. Well, the people meant a huge amount to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me open it up either, either to further address this question or to ask questions of the panel. But if, if, you, if, you know, if you don't want to, I'll try and repeat your question. Otherwise, I uh, appreciate if you try and use the mic. But, um. And let me just make a comment while the first one is getting up there. Um, there's a bunch of people in the room who did just as much as any of us uh, with the project. So uh, don't feel like you have to address questions just to, to the people who happen to get stuck up here in these chairs. <laughs> and, and also, please identify yourself for the film. Right. Um, I'm Bill Gord. I graduated uh, from here in 1974, although I continue to identify myself as the class of 69. I did want to address the command line thing you were talking about. Um, after the control data 3600, which was purely a scientific machine, you know, piles of card decks, uh, wait in line for two or three days to get your job run while well, the tapes got found and put back and all that. Um, Ken was very much wanting the students, undergraduate students, um, access to the machine. That's when the whole interactive DITRAN thing started up in the, well, 68, 69 timeframe. Um, but after that, um, it was important to Ken to get a uh, real computer on campus, and that's when the Burroughs 6900 came on the site. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, 64. 6,500, which became a 6,700. And um, again, showing Ken's commitments to undergraduates, I was the undergraduate that was on that selection committee, uh, picking a whole new campus computer. But one of the, staying with the theme of the command line, um, we were fortunate to be able to have graphics terminals. We had a lot of teletypes, but we had a few graphics terminals, some Tektronics, some other things, I don't remember all the brands. And one of, there was a program on the Burroughs machine called Candy, C-A-N-D-E, -E, Command and Edit. And it was a very command line oriented thing. And my mentor at the time, uh, Dr. Daryl High, who was a uh, chemist, transferred over to computing before I got involved, um, he had gone off to the Burroughs Corporation and actually worked more on Candy to make it better. Um, but I would like to assert without proof, that uh, Ken was very well aware of that uh, command line interface on glass terminals, uh, and that that would have been in his mind as he moved into UCSD Pascal. I left before UCSD Pascal was established. It was forming. I think I met you, but that's a long time ago. My brain's For me somewhere too. else. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And so I, I just want to say that there's, Ken had some drag along from just his own history to bring in that command line interface. And I can talk about that whole area more than you want to hear, so I'll just sit down. So certainly the interactivity was there. It yeah. was, but it, was a, it wasn't a command, a single letter prompt tree of commands. It was a MS-DOS style type of command. It was a precursor of MS-DOS. 
There was no MS DOS yet. Right. There mm -hmm. was no MS. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, my name's uh, good, ap good afternoon. My name's Tom Tepertzer. I graduated in uh, 79 uh, with a degree in computer science and took my first course at the uh, APIS 61. And so I think the legacy is the impact on, uh, <clears throat> on education. Uh, I can attest personally, thank God, I took uh, UCSD Pascal APIS 61, it was called at the time, um, before I took Fortran or COBOL. And, and I can tell you with the conviction of every bone in my body, there's probably thousands of students just like me uh, that ha had our first introduction to computers been Fortran or COBOL, we would have gone a different direction, for sure. Um, certainly for myself personally. Um, the other thing I can attest to is I was fortunate enough in the 80s and 90s to travel all over the world. Um, and uh, it would always surprise me to hear somebody talk about learning programming from UCSD Pascal. Um, and, and I'm talking Australia, Germany, the UK, <clears throat> some really exotic places like Texas and North Carolina, Boston. Uh, and here's the interesting thing. It wasn't just the uh, students who graduated with a degree in computer science. There's a whole generation of self-taught programmers um, that learned with UCSD Pascal. Uh, that's fantastic. And so um, I think that's a great thing. Thank you. My name's Doug Bell. I never went to UCSD. Um, I know people that knew Ken Bowles, but I never knew Ken Bowles. Um, I did port the uh, Softec P system, the generic 68K version to the Atari ST, so that might be my claim to fame with <laughs> UCSD Pascal. But my question was uh, if it seems to me that the, the, the P system and the editor and the compiler and everything around it was really the precursor to the modern IDE. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, Borland and Think C, and there were some others that, that really made it, you know, a much more useful thing, and that it knew about, you know, when it started to know about your whole project. But I can't think of an uh, earlier sort of integrated environment where you, you had all the pieces working together like that. And so I was wondering what your take on that was. And I'll leave you to answer. So there was like the benefits of being old. Um, <laughs> IBM had an APL machine that mm -hmm. was a full integrated development environment. So it was um, about the same time as we were doing UCSD Pascal. And interpretive, as I recall. It was interpreted as well. Uh, it, it, that, that was earlier. That was the early 1970s. We used to use it on Tektronic terminals. I think the point here is that a lot of people came up with different pieces. What I will say was part of the genius of Ken, in addition to being able to put people together, to work together, and that kind of thing, were how he managed to bring the best parts of different things and put them together in a very synergistic way. Recognizing early on the possibility for microcomputers, that's what we called them before, they were personal computers. Uh, Seymour Papert and the turtle graphics, uh, the ideas about programming in terms of integrating uh, encapsulation, the Keller plan self-paced method of teaching, putting things, it, it's that type of integration as opposed to the type of silo thinking that one so often sees where even if there's multiple things, there's a central silo and the things are tacking on. So all of these things I think, and if there's a lesson to be taken away from the Pascal project, it's probably the value of the integration of different things and the respect that different things have for each other. Um, my name is Kathy Herring Hayashi. I'm the class of 82 Computer Science. And I guess the, the, the topics that I want to bring up is, is the impact of Pascal. Well, first of all, I'm with Ravel College, and as a junior, um, they said that I couldn't go on unless I picked a major. And I was, I was mystified. It's like, what am I going to do? What am I going to pick? And what I said was, well, 
And, and, and the counselor just asked me, what is it that you enjoyed? Out of all your classes, what did you enjoy? Well, I had taken a class called APIS 61 or EEC 61, and um, I said, well, I liked making those flowers. I thought that was pretty good. Right? And, and in my background, it says, as a kid, I looked back, and I, I'd done spirographs, and I'd done those, you know, the gooey flower things, and it's like, oh, I've always liked that. But in terms of education and impact, it touched me in a place that made sense, right? And after that, you know, and so, I, you know, so the counselor quickly wrote down my name as computer science. I noticed how quickly they did that. Um, but then after that, I enjoyed the next two years for uh, getting a computer science degree. And I went on to work at Burroughs. And I did all the candy, and I did the Pascal. And I've been in computer science ever since then, in fact, in semiconductor development. And so I hope that you understand the, the impact that you've made in terms, and you know, Ken, and Kenneth Bull's e legacy is one is the education, yes, touching the people, making sure it was a way that I understood it, and then the impact is like, yeah, that makes sense. And I use that and apply it. In fact, I could even say today that the things that I learned then are impactful today. So I was wondering, and just as a question for you all, is did you even, uh, your scope is huge and your impact is amazing, and thank you. Did you, did you know that that the impact that you had in both production code and the, and the impact that people that, I'm still in the industry and loving tech, and I've got to say it's because of the way that I was introduced to computer science. So were you aware of the impact that you made? That's a great, thanks for sharing that. I think the answer is no. <laughs> Not until now. <laughs> Okay, my next? Okay, uh, yeah, I'm Barry Demshack. Uh, I was on the Pascal project as well. Video and, star. Uh, yeah, video star, yeah, okay. Uh, so, two things for the record that I should point out is that uh, what I think was unique in APIS 61, that the class was the uh, participation and organization of tutors. Uh, the orchestrator of which was Keith Shillington, I'm pretty sure. And so um, I've never seen a lab uh, or, uh, organized that way so prolifically and, um, and extensively as that until along comes Rick Ord, who's a um, uh, lecturer emeritus here who I think can count hundreds of students that he enlisted as tutors in his classes and gives frequent credit to Ken Bowles. And so I want to point out that that organization of uh, students teaching students was pretty darn effective, and it has its, it has, it has legs. But the other thing that I don't think has been raised here is the concept of units, which are to say separate compilation modules. Uh, at the time that we were working on that system, I think that uh, DEC had separate compilation modules that could be linked in. That was no big trick. We did that too, uh, eventually. But what we also created were dynamically linked units. I think that Mark Overgaard had a lot to do with that, and the uh, I think Rich Gleaves did too. And so the those were the predecessors of dynamic link library. Now, if you want to then postulate that DLL hell can be uh, tra <laughs> traced back to the Pascal project, that's up to you. <laughs> Uh, I, I want to build on that in two ways, very briefly. First of all, at UC Irvine, we imported uh, the teaching of our introductory programming class and saw many, well, we also imported Dennis Volper, uh, which was also a very good move. But having said that, we saw exactly that the proctors, the tutors, we did some very creative things to get around university restrictions as to who could teach who. But what I will tell you is I follow the careers of many of those people who had the opportunity to teach, proctor, whatever, and transmit their knowledge. And they've gone on to some very influential places. Uh, I won't list them out, but what I will say is this idea of who you learn with as opposed to who you learn from. It, it went in multiple directions. The second thing is the idea, and this is true of a number of things, dynamically linked libraries, uh, graphically oriented, street oriented things, those things did in fact exist. I'll go back to the history books and we'll find them different places. But UCSD Pascal put them out there, never mind for the people who were the cognoscenti in UC academia, 
or UC industry, but all across the world. And I think that it's not necessarily always who's first with it, but how do you get it out there in a way that's accessible to people? And that's another real contribution, the democratization of a lot of this stuff that otherwise might have just died in. Um, a more uh, fundamental part of democratization, uh, Joan mentioned it, but how many people in the room kind of got through school partially funded by UCSD Pascal? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was a scholarship financial aid, <laughs> and I got to tell you, I got out of UCSD with four years with like $2,000 mm -hmm. in loans, which mm -hmm. was insanely wonderful. Mm -hmm. Now, did you want to make a comment on the Bowles scholarship and potential uh, for... <laughs> Donations to it. Great lead, and I love that. What a setup! You get the shot, he gets the assist. Yeah, yes, no, no. Bring um, out your checkbook. Right, no. It's, you know, uh, a, a lot of people have benefited from from, from a lot of people. Uh, uh, can I think the whole project and. And you know, if, if people want to give back, I think there are great opportunities to do that. Certainly, the, the Ken Ball Scholarship is, is a great one. You make some money off the royalties, <laughs> and, and, and 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 certainly that that has had an impact, and that is part of you know part of our current legacy, right? Is is uh, 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 you know getting getting that jump start, um, and uh, uh, but but yeah, there's some great opportunities, and I think they're important because uh, the, we, you know we still have so many students come through that that, that, that have needs and are struggling in similar ways. Yeah, uh, my name's Ray Causey. I was on the Pascal project from '78 to '80, and I was in the training lab. That's kind of what my bailiwick was. I took over the grading system. I think you wrote it, didn't you, Richard, originally, or did you write it, Keith? The original. Yeah. Yeah, so I was I was part of the other side of the project, not the not the part that made a lot of money, the part that that taught the students. And my recollection of Ken was we were involved with the part where we were moving from Terax to Apples, and going from a non-networked lab to a networked lab, and trying to connect together Ethernet networks with parallel cables before you could figure out how to do that. And Ken would walk over and go, figure it out. Let me know if you have a problem. And he'd walk off. And then we were doing some other stuff. And he'd go, have any problems? Uh, we'll figure it out. OK, good. So what it taught me was I, I, was, I was so, you know, I was an undergrad. Um, he, he had faith in the people that worked on the project, that they could figure out stuff that had never been done before without sitting there going, do this, do this, do this, and you know, having Mark describe everything, and then undergrads, go work on it. You know, he, and he empowered all of the people on the project to do their job, and, and it affected my entire career, so that when I became into management, and I had people reporting to me, I was the CIO of a number of companies, and I had directors come to me, I said, never come to me with a problem without having two options, because that means you figured it out, I get to, I get to pick which one, and that's the way Ken did things. If we had a problem, we'd said, I've got this thing, I could do it this way or this way, and he'd walk us through it, but he'd let us figure out the problems. And that, to me, is a legacy that he left me. All right, uh, we've, we've gone way over time, but I'm, I, I, I have not seen any uh, dirty looks from the audience. I don't think people mind. But any, any last comments that any of you want to make? I want to thank you for the opportunity to get us together. Mm -hmm. Yes. <coughs> thank, thank you. Very much. Thank you.